The World Tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. And greetings, everybody. I've been asking recently, what is God? Now, humans were created in the image of God. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Man was made in the image of that form and shape of God. Now, God is composed of spirit, but he formed man of matter. So we're not composed of spirit like God. God creates in the system of duality. He doesn't create everything just all at once. There are two stages, always. The creation of man. It began with a physical man in Adam. Then there's the spiritual creation of man, and that begins in Christ. Adam was a physical man. Christ was the spiritual man from heaven. And uh, everything that God creates is done in a dual manner. I've explained how God did not create angels complete all at once. He could not create character in them all at once. And that's what he can't do in man. And the spiritual creation is the installation of godly, holy, righteous character within us that, of course, we have to make the decision. We have to be willing. We have to hunger and thirst for it. But it comes from God. It's not our righteousness. Our righteousness are just like a lot of filthy rags to God. But it is the very righteousness of God which... By his Holy Spirit, he gives or puts into us. Now, humans were created in the form and shape of God and with one spirit in them, which needs another spirit to go with it and needs the Holy Spirit. And the one spirit we have gives us physical and material knowledge. Only the knowledge that can come through the eyes, through the ears, through the nose, the mouth, or the sense of feel and touch. And uh, you cannot know naturally anything else except just what you know through those five senses. Now, you can't know the things of God and the things that God has prepared for us. And that's why so much of the Bible with a spiritual knowledge is just like so much foolishness. Now, I'd like to have you notice, uh, if you would, for a moment, over in uh, John 14, verses 8 and 9. Philip uh, said unto Christ, he said, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice us. He said, well, what does the Father look like? We'd like to know what does God look like? And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? In other words, Christ looked exactly like the Father. I think I mentioned recently that I had an aunt, uh, <laughs> and if I believed in souls going to heaven, I would say, God bless her soul, because uh, she's not living any longer. But she was a social climber and, and uh, joined the church that uh, she thought is in the highest society. She said, I, uh, I just can't stand that God of the Old Testament. He was a cruel stern, cruel God. Well, you know what I read about the God of the Old Testament? That he is a God full of mercy, and his mercy is greater toward us than the heavens are high above the earth, and pities us like a father with his own children. A God of such great love and mercy. That's what I find in the God of the Old Testament. She just never had read it. And uh, she had been told that the Old Testament just Old Testament stuff, and we mustn't look at it. But you see, Paul told Timothy, who uh, became an evangelist and went out preaching under Paul, he said that the scriptures that he had known from a child. The only scriptures Timothy had known from a child were the Old Testament scriptures. And Paul said that are able to make thee wise unto salvation, which is in Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation which is in Jesus Christ. And then again, Paul said to the Corinthians that the uh, things written in the Old Testament were examples for our admonitions on whom the ends of the world are come. 
And they're written for us in the New Testament. And you know that the church is founded on the very basis, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. You know there were almost no prophets in the New Testament. Did you know that? You go look it up in the Concordance and see how many you can find. There's one prophetess and one prophet. And their whole job was to receive a message direct from God and take it to the apostle. But they didn't go to the people. They didn't preach. They didn't say anything to the people. Now, it's true that in New Testament language, prophesy always means not just to foretell, but sometimes it means preaching under inspiration. It doesn't mean just quietly talking. It means preaching with real fire and with full earnestness and power, with your whole heart in it. It sometimes means that. But uh, you see, much of the New Testament is just the Old Testament scriptures quoted, quoted verbatim in the New Testament. And uh, those things were written for our admonition. So the church is based on the foundation of the prophets of the Old Testament as well as the apostles of the New, and uh, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Now, where did the church get their knowledge? Where did they get the doctrine, their understanding, and what they were supposed to believe? They didn't get it through a committee. They didn't appoint a committee to study and say, let's decide what we want to believe. They didn't get it like Constantine did in 325 A.D., when they had this great controversy about the Trinity and about the Easter and uh, Passover situation and the Quarto de Semini controversy. Constantine, the emperor of the Roman Empire, who was not a religious man, that, uh, although he, he finally claimed to accept Christianity, and he called this conference and he simply told the church what they had to believe. He said, I'm making it official, you've got to believe the Trinity, whether it's so or not, you have to, you've got to believe it. And uh, they've been believing it ever since. But I don't. Now, you believe it if you want to. I, I'm not going to control what you believe. But uh, I have proved that a Trinity will only limit God. Now, I hope I can get on to show you that God is much more than a Trinity. Now, I'd like to have you notice in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, this is one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. I remember up in Eugene, Oregon, oh, this is at least 40 years ago, I took the whole church one time, and we went out way up the Mackenzie Highway into the mountains where we could see the mountains. And uh, I remember I read to them out of the 40th chapter of Isaiah while we were out in the open air looking at the great lofty mountains there, the Cascade Mountains. Anyway, let me read a little of it, beginning with uh, verse 12. It'd be nice if I had time to read the entire and whole 40th chapter of Isaiah. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, that is, the oceans, and measured them in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with a span, and comprehended the host of the earth in a measure, and uh, weighed the mountains in scales. Now, can you do that? Can you think of a man taking great mountains and weighing them in scales? It shows you how puny we are, but God can do things like that. And the hills in a balance, a balance that you weigh things on. Who hath directed the spirit of the eternal, or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel? And uh, who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations, all the nations of the earth now, are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. The little dust that would be on the balance of the scales that you weigh things on, dust that you probably can't see if you don't take your dust cloth and dust it off. They probably don't even tip the scales because they don't weigh that much. The dust and the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations 
are before him as nothing and are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Now, that is showing you the comparison between man and God. And yet, what uh, David was saying back there, and what I want to read to you if we have time on this program, in uh, the second chapter of Hebrews, man has the potential of becoming very God and as great as God is, except God will always be supreme in authority. God is supreme in authority over the uh, Word who became Christ. And Christ said, The Father that sent me, and he gave me a commandment what I should do and what I should speak. And he said, As the Father taught me, I have spoken. Christ was always absolutely obedient to his Father. Now, he's showing how great God is compared to nations the way nations are now. And yet we in the nations can. We have such a potential. We can become as great as God until we're in the very family of God. You never heard a man speak like this before in your life. Nobody else, no church, no religion on earth knows these things. I'm giving you things such as man never spoke in your hearing before. And you better open your ears. You better understand that you're hearing things that are tremendous and tremendously important. Well, let's see. Let's go on a little further over here in verse... Uh, uh, beginning with verse 25 and verse 26. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One? That is, of course, Yahweh, or the one who became Christ. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who has created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, and uh, the greatness of his might, uh, by the greatness of his might. For that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord? Now he goes on in verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the eternal, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? He never gets tired. He rested on the first Sabbath day and was refreshed. But it wasn't because he was tired. He rested to put his own presence in that day. And it's been there ever since on the Holy Sabbath day. You know, I told you before how way back in the autumn of 1926, my wife turned to religious fanaticism. She began keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Why, I said, that's crazy. And I really thought it was. I thought that was, of all things, fanaticism. So I had to dig into the Bible. She said, well, you show me where it says keep Sunday and I'll do it. Well, I was just sure the Bible said you must observe Sunday. But I had to eat crow. And that's where I took a licking. I mentioned that time and time again. And uh, I think not many ever took the beating that I did in being converted and had their minds swept as clean as mine was of everything you had ever believed before. And I saw that here was the word of God, here was the words of truth, and now I had a firm foundation I could believe what's here. And as Jesus Christ in person taught the apostles and taught Paul, even though he had already ascended to heaven, he must have some way appeared to Paul. Uh, it doesn't explain how Paul mentioned he had seen Christ, he had been with Christ. But the Bible is the word of God in writing. Jesus Christ is the Word of God in person. And the only difference is that one's in person and the other's in writing, but they all say the same thing. Exactly. I was taught by the Word of God in writing. And everything else was swept clean out of my mind. And is to this day. Well, I tell you, some people say, where do you get all your energy? And uh, I've said that I have more power and energy now than most men of 40 or 50. And uh, well, I'll show you. Let's just read a little more right here in this 40th chapter of Isaiah, and I'll tell you where I get it. He, God, giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. When I lack strength, I ask God to increase my strength. I just ask God to give me more strength and give me the power, and he does. He increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and grow weary. You know, they can get very tired. 
and worn out. And the young men shall uh, utterly fall, but they that wait upon the eternal shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That is where I get my strength. That is the source of it. It's not within myself. And some people can't understand that. You don't realize that God is the great giver, and he wants to give us such wonderful things. But I want him to give me that which I can use in serving him. I don't ask for it for my own pleasure. I don't ask for it for some selfish reason. But I want it that I can serve you who are listening to me. Well, now, why should so great a God, as great as he is, be concerned about man? Now we turn over to the second chapter of Hebrews, and he quotes what uh, David said in the eighth psalm, but he goes on a little farther. And uh, Hebrews, the second chapter, beginning with verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Now, what's he speaking about the world to come? That's whereof he's speaking here. You want to get the context. What is it speaking about in the context? It's speaking about the world to come, not about the present world. And uh, it says there, under the angels, he has not put in subjection the world to come. That infers, implies, that the angels were in the control of the earth, that it was under subjection to the angels, but it will not be in the world to come. But in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Now here we are, all the nations are not a drop in the bucket compared to God. In one of the Psalms of where he sits, he looks down and he beholds all mankind. He observes all that they do. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. God is that great. But one in a certain place saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Why should God be concerned about a puny, insignificant little man? What is our potential? It isn't just to invent a, an electric light. Thomas Edison was, I think, as physical as uh, human beings go, and uh, he was one of our great men. But Thomas A. Edison did not know God. Luther Burbank dealt with flowers and, and shrubs and plants, but Luther Burbank did not know God. And I can't understand that. You would think a man dealing in nature like that would have known something about God. But he couldn't know. He had uh, gone to college or university or something and, and had uh, evolution stuffed into his mind. He had been brainwashed, in other words. Now here, thou madest him a little lower than the angels, Thou crownest him with glory and uh, honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Now, what are the works of God's hands? Well, David had mentioned in the Psalms, all the stars, all the heavens, all the mighty things, how he can even weigh a mountain in a, in a balance, in a scale. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his man's feet. Now, surely he can't mean that, all things. If you turn to the first chapter, it says here about Christ, how God in these last days has spoken to us by a son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. That all things is translated in the Moffat translation. In other words, it really means, in the English language, the universe. It means all things, the whole universe. And that's the way it is translated, but not in the King James here. For in that he, God, put all in subjection under him, under man, he, God, left nothing that is not put under him. Oh, surely he can't mean that. Well, let's read on. But now we see not yet all things put under man. No, God has made us to have dominion over the surface of the earth, over the air, and the fowl that fly on the air, and uh, over the waters of the ocean. 
we can go down in, uh, pretty deep in the water. We can uh, fly in the air. I often fly at 41 to 45,000 feet in my own airplane. And uh, uh, although I don't pilot it, you can understand, I, I'm not a pilot. However, God has provided me with what I need because he has uh, sent me an apostle as one sent forth. And I have been sent forth with God's message to the kings and the heads of government and the nations of this world. And God has provided the means, and I try to use them for that purpose, and I never use them for my own personal service in any way. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now here, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that God put all things in subjection under man, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things the whole universe put under him. Not yet. Now let's read on. But what do we see now? We see Jesus, who was crucified, who was raised by a resurrection from the dead, and who then ascended on up to heaven, and where he is living, the living Jesus Christ today as our high priest. Now I've been speaking for some time on radio from the book of Hebrews on what is Jesus Christ doing now? What is Christ doing today? Most people think, oh, he's just going way off and maybe he died, and maybe he's just going way off somewhere. Oh, no. Christ is our high priest. I look to Christ every day. I look to him for the strength. He's the one that increased the strength that I was reading you about a while ago. And uh, I find that, that uh, those things are real. I find that God means what he says, and what he says here, he means. He says what he means, and he means what he says. We see now Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. He is already crowned. He has gone to heaven, the throne of God, to be given the crown of earth rule. And when he comes, the coronation ceremony will have already taken place. And he's coming in great power and glory and great splendor as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to rule all nations and to bring us peace at last. That's the only hope that this world has. The only hope. You know, some people, because we preach from the Bible, say that we are preaching a, a hellfire doctrine and a doctrine of doom. Well, instead of doom, we preach just the opposite. We preach the most great potential ahead that God has, and nobody else does preach it. Isn't that funny how they take you just the opposite in the public press? But we see Jesus, who made a little lower than the angel for the suffering of death. He now is crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death as he did for every man, and it's appointed to all men once to die, but after that the judgment or the resurrection. For it became him Christ, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. As I read to you in John 1, verse 1, all things were created by him in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus Christ was born very God by resurrection from the dead, and he is called in the eighth chapter of uh, the book of Romans, the firstborn of many brethren. And he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And yet, in the first chapter here, if you would have the Moffat translation that says the whole universe, a point of the heir of the whole universe, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his, or the Father's glory, Christ is the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his person, an image there, Moffat translates that as the identical character, the holy, righteous character of God, and upholding all things, upholding the whole universe by the word of his power. That's how great is our Christ now. 
and he's the firstborn of many brethren. He's gone ahead as the pioneer. We have that potential to follow. Now, that is not all. Once we are there, well, we are to rule over the entire universe. Now, uh, th there's much more to it that I have not time for now, because the creation is not yet complete. Remember I said that God creates by duality? First man is physical, then he'll be spiritual. First angels were made out of spirit, but their character had to be developed, and their creation was not complete until they had developed that. God created the earth, as I've said, like unfinished furniture. But it has to be finished later. And he meant for angels when he put them on earth to finish the beautifying at the surface of the earth. And when they didn't do it, he meant for man to. And instead of beautifying it, we have ruined, we have polluted everything that man's hand has been able to touch of God's earth. That's what man has done. Now, I've explained how God did not create angels complete all at once. He could not create character in them all at once. And that's what he can't do in man. And the spiritual creation is the installation of godly, holy, righteous character within us that, of course, we have to make the decision. We have to be willing. We have to hunger and thirst for it. But it comes from God. It's not our righteousness. Our righteousness are just like a lot of filthy rags to God. But it is the very righteousness of God which... By his Holy Spirit, he gives or puts into us. Now, you can't know the things of God and the things that God has prepared for us. And that's why so much of the Bible with a spiritual knowledge is just like so much foolishness. And yet God has given us this wonderful, great potential. Thank God this is not the day when God is calling everyone and most people. Jesus Christ said, no man can come to me except the Father which sent me, draw him. And God is only drawing a few. And to those few of us he is drawing, he is drawing us for a purpose. And that purpose always is preparing for the kingdom of God that is coming. It's a wonderful thing. But oh, what a mighty God we have. Well, that's it until next time. This is Herbert W. Armstrong saying goodbye, friends, until next time. <laughs> You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. For literature offered on this program, send your requests along with the call letters of this station to Herbert W. Armstrong. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.